Just yesterday, President Biden announced a new plan to help with the burden of housing costs. Today, we are going to go through the full briefing, which basically explains how the Biden-Harris administration plans to help close the housing supply gap within the next five years. So let's get started. So the Biden-Harris administration put out this housing supply action plan, and they said that this is to ease the burden of housing costs over time by boosting the supply of quality housing in every community. Now, I'll go ahead and say straight out that this plan does cover both affordable rental housing as well as affordable homes like to purchase. So they are going to tackle both aspects of housing in this. They go on to say that the plan includes legislation to help close America's housing supply shortfall in the next five years. So that's when they want to turn everything around. They are going to start off by creating and preserving hundreds of thousands of affordable housing units. They are going to also target rental assistance as well as down payment assistance, which is something that we have seen from this administration in the past. And then they go on to say that this is the most comprehensive of all government efforts to close the housing supply shortfall in history. So in this main overview, they talk about how the focus is going to be on building and preserving rental housing for low and moderate income families. Now, their policies to do this are going to boost supply, and that's going to be an important element of bringing homeownership within reach for Americans for who today cannot find affordable homes because there are too few homes available in their communities. So there are a few different broad ways that the Biden-Harris administration plans to tackle this goal within the next five years. So those are one, they are going to reward jurisdictions that have reformed zoning and land use policies. Two, they're gonna deploy new financing mechanisms to build and preserve more housing where financing gaps currently exist. And then they go on to talk about how this is going to be manufactured housing, accessory dwelling units or ADUs, two to four unit properties, as well as smaller multifamily buildings. The reason that they're specifically targeting those four in this group is because those are things that have historically been a little bit harder to get financing for. A lot of times when you're talking about manufactured housing, especially, or some smaller multifamily units, it's hard to get financing for those in an affordable way. Usually they're requiring larger down payments or higher interest rate. The third thing that they're gonna do is expand and improve existing forms of federal financing. The fourth thing is ensure that more government-owned supply of homes and other housing goes to owners who will actually live in them. And the fifth thing is they want to finish construction in 2022 on the most new homes in any year since 2006. Continuing in the beginning first statements, they go on to say that the rising housing costs are years in the making. So this wasn't something that was just pandemic fueled. They go on to say that the mismatch between housing supply and housing demand grew, obviously, in the pandemic, and that the shortfall in housing supply is now more than 1.5 million homes nationwide. That's why they are going to be so aggressive with targeting this over the next just few years. Scrolling forward, let's go ahead and break down those five ways that the Biden-Harris administration plans to fully execute this plan. The first one was providing incentives for land use and zoning reform and reducing regulatory barriers. So how they are going to do this is they are going to leverage transportation funding from bipartisan infrastructure law and this was going to reward jurisdictions that have put into place land use policies to promote density and rural main street revitalization. They're also going to implement this unlocking possibilities program and this is going to establish a new 1.75 billion competitive grant program administered by HUD to help states and localities eliminate needless barriers to affordable housing production, including permitting for manufactured housing communities. So remember the first facet of their plan here all has to do with zoning. So one of the big things is that mobile home communities or manufactured home communities have been hard to zone out and place in certain areas. A lot of times there is a demand for those affordable types of homes, but there's just nowhere in a mass scale to put them. They also want the housing supply fund grants to reduce affordable housing barriers. Tackling the second facet of their plan is piloting new financing for housing production and preservation. So they say a second significant barrier to increasing housing supply is a lack of attractive and low cost financing for new construction and rehabilitation, particularly for units that are affordable. So it says market gaps exist for the construction and rehabilitation of single family homes, two to four unit properties, ADU construction, manufactured and modular housing delivery, and smaller multifamily properties. This is like what we talked about in the beginning. 
So they're gonna support the production and availability of manufactured housing. They go on to say that most people right now, in order to buy manufactured housing, are relying on personal property financing rather than conventional mortgages. And this is because it's very difficult to meet the criteria for a conventional mortgage when you are using or, or purchasing a manufactured house. And this is because unless manufactured houses are permanently attached to the land, they are considered personal property, not real property. This has been an issue because that personal property financing typically costs more than a traditional mortgage due to higher interest rates and shorter loan terms. So Freddie Mac, with the help of obviously the government, has announced that it will complete a feasibility assessment for requirements and processes necessary to support loan purchases of personal property manufactured housing loans. So this could be huge in aiding people with purchasing manufactured housing. This would probably decrease the down payment required as well as get them more favorable borrowing terms. In addition to this, they wanna scale up ADUs and pilot ADU and home renovation financing tools. Remember, ADU stands for Accessory Dwelling Unit. So they go on to say that a lot of local jurisdictions have already made land use changes to permit the construction and renovation of ADUs, which can offset the cost of home ownership while expanding the supply of affordable rental housing. That sounds like a win-win for the market that we are in right now. Just think about this. If you were interested in renting out an ADU, you probably would be able to get that for a pretty affordable price since that is a dwelling separate from a primary residence, but on someone's land. So it's like an accessory building. Think of like an in-law house in the back of a property. On top of that, renting that property out can help the primary homeowner offset their cost of home ownership, therefore making it a little bit more affordable for them to live in their house as well. So that would essentially solve two problems. They say that these types of reforms, when combined with policies to improve financing options, could lead to the creation of more than 1 million ADUs in the next five years. In addition to zoning and land use changes, achieving that goal will require simpler and more affordable financing options for homeowners and builders. They're also exploring avenues to help lenders pilot and scale renovation and construction financing for ADUs, particularly for low and moderate income homeowners. Let me know in the comments below whether you would be interested in building like another dwelling in your backyard and renting that out as a rental to someone that you may not know, but having that income help you offset your house payment. Let me know in the comments below. This is something that I've really been interested in personally. I don't think it would bother me at all to have a separate house and building that someone would live in and rent out. Very similar to kind of a duplex situation where you would live in one and rent out the other half. So another thing that they wanna do is boost rural single family construction. So this is going to encourage more single family supply to be built up more quickly in rural areas throughout the country. They also are going to provide tax credits to build and rehabilitate over 125,000 thousand homes for low and middle income home buyers. The tax credits would encourage investment into millions of homes that are otherwise too costly or too difficult to develop or rehabilitate. And this would be only available to owner occupants rather than large investors. So if you are interested in buying a rundown property to fix up and then live in, but the costs to do that would exceed the property's value after you're done rehabbing it, you would be a good candidate for these specific programs. They're also going to provide housing supply fund financing for affordable housing production to develop 500,000 units for housing for low and moderate income renters and home buyers. Now the whole next section of this is improving and expanding existing federal financing. Now you can see how long this section is. I read through every word of it. We are really not going to touch on it because this is all specific to like financing at a developer level. So these are all doing like grants and tax incentives and different funding available for large scale multifamily units targeting low to moderate income renters and home buyers. So there is a lot in this that is specifically trying to incentivize builders and developers to do those things and to build new things or rehab properties targeting a end buyer or end renter that's gonna be in that low to mid income area. But because that is so like developer focused, we're just gonna breeze past it. But just know that that is in there. And of course, the link to this will be in the description of the video if you're really interested in it. 
you can go check it out. The next big facet of this is preserving the availability of affordable single family homes for owner occupants. If you guys have been in the real estate market and have been beaten out again and again and again by these large investment companies and are just sick of how hard it has become as a individual owner occupant to buy a house, this section is specifically written up for you. They go on to say that the share of single family home purchases by investors has grown, comprising more than 25% of all purchases nationally in some months of 2021, with an even higher share in certain markets like Atlanta, San Jose, and Phoenix. Almost a quarter of these purchases were made by investors with over 100 properties. Large investor purchases of single family homes drive up home prices. That They don't need to tell us that. You guys are already experiencing it. For lower cost starter homes, making it harder for aspiring first time home buyers and first generation home buyers, among others, to access wealth building opportunities from home ownership. I know, government, you are preaching to the choir. But the good thing is, they're going to do some things to hopefully help combat this in the future. They're going to be directing supply to owner occupants and mission driven entities instead of large investors. FHA and the enterprises at the direction of FHFA have extended the period during which available real estate owned REO properties are made available to only, only the owner occupants and nonprofit organizations. They've extended this. This used to be a 10 day period. They've extended this 30 days. What this means is that if you guys were interested in buying an REO or a foreclosure, that instead of having a 10 day period where you guys can bid on those before any large investors can, they have now opened that up to a 30 day period. So there's going to be a 30 day period where only people who are interested in buying the home to live in personally, or like they said, one of these nonprofit organizations can can jump in on that. Otherwise, after 30 days, if no one has bid on it, it's going to go to potentially investors. Now they are making this change because they want to target the sale of at least 50% of mortgage notes of those properties to owner occupants and mission driven entities. The last thing that they tackle in this plan is addressing other constraints to supply, which is materials cost and labor supply. So they go on to explain obviously that they recognize that the price of goods used in residential construction has increased. They also kind of call out the home builders and say that there has been limited adoption of potentially cost saving offsite building techniques. Also, they understand labor supply challenges. Through this plan, they said that they have a goal of achieving the most completed housing units in a single year in 15 years. So how are they gonna do that? One, they're going to partner with private sector to address supply chain disruptions for building materials. So they want to basically take in a partnership to turn the record number of homes under construction into completed homes where Americans can live. They're also going to promote modular, penalized, and manufactured housing and construction R&D. To further combat affordable housing and supply issues, obviously, the through this plan, they are trying to get builders to use these modular, penalized, manufactured housing products that can be built off-site somewhere and then transported to the end destination, because that is going to ramp up production of homes in a much faster way. And this is something that you've probably seen and heard a lot about. Other countries are adopting this a lot quicker than the US. I don't know if you guys have seen any of these like modular type communities or builds, but if you have, let me know because I, I think they're kind of cool. Like personally, I don't think that I would have an issue living in one of these homes, but I'm happy that not only are they trying to push this as a good potential cost savings for builders that they can pass on to renters slash home buyers, but also they are addressing that there are inconsistent local inspection standards because in a lot of different areas, a lot of different states and cities, inspection guidelines differ and a modular home or a manufactured home may not meet all of those standards. So if there's one unified standard that they can put out or use to make exclusions for, I think that that would generally make home builders and corporations a lot more excited about this technology and 
you know, more comfortable with using it because then they're not going to run into any issues like when they go to sell or rent these out. The last thing that they go on to say is that they want to recruit more workers into good paying construction jobs. This does tackle the last little bit of this section where they addressed labor supply challenges and how they plan on doing this is by increasing the number of registered apprenticeships for career technical education, as well as for pre-apprenticeship programs like Job Corps and Youth Build, which increase the pipeline of construction workers. So going through all of this, I think it's an exciting plan, but I also think it's a very aggressive plan. It'll be interested to see how this plays out. Obviously, I don't think, in my opinion, that this plan or much of it will affect kind of your middle income earner or your your middle of the line home buyer because a lot of this is specifically targeting like the low to moderate income earners. Now, if you are someone who needs down payment assistance to buy a house, if you are someone who is struggling to pay rent as rent prices go up, I do think that this administration is really enacting this plan to try and help combat those things. So there will likely be some opportunities for you in the next five years, depending on how much of this actually comes into fruition. But for those of you who are maybe a two income household, or your mid to high earners and are just struggling right now because of all of the competition in the market, unfortunately, I don't see a lot of this that's going to help because even if we see a, a large amount of that low to moderate income housing coming about, that's probably not going to be the kind of inventory that you need. Just my two cents, since this was brand new, I wanted to go ahead and break it down. Let me know what you guys think of this. Do you think that this could be something that is going to help the market overall? Let me know in the comments below. I'm Nicole Nark, Arkansas real estate broker with videos to help you find your way home, and I will see you in the next one.